This is Derek Jones. This is DJ Severe. This is J.R. Robinson. This is Mike C. This is Natalie Dunn. This is Jay Moore. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan East. This is Eric E.Q. Young. This is Greg Cripps. This is Thomas McElroy. This is Michael Colon. Hey, this is John Leon Gray. Hey, I'm Mark Fowley. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> this is Rick Morata, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero, Mark Valley, and Pete A. Turner. Beautiful. Rick Murata made his proverbial bones as a session drummer. His fluidly unfailing pocket, his less is more approach, and subtly infectious hitch have been the foundations of a diverse and downright voluminous roster of artists to include Aretha, Waylon Jennings, The Jacksons, Jackson Brown, Paul Simon, Carly Simon, Quincy Jones, John Lennon, and Jim Croce. He's also an amazing producer, and these days he's composing music for film and television, shows like Everybody Loves Raymond and Yes, Dear. And uh, he's here on the Break It Down show, and I am elated. Thanks for having us. Thanks for coming. The studio looks great. You were just telling us about uh, how you're still kind of setting up and yeah, still getting here from the summers that you spend uh, on Martha's Vineyard. Yeah. The reason I did this was because I the commute was turning into a 45-minute commute in Los Angeles. And you were going down the street. And now I have a 66-yard commute. I took my golf range finder, and I stood on my front porch, and I looked at the the door here. And you came up with 66 yards. Yeah, it's 66 yards. So that's like a nine iron. That's a, you get, <laughs> it's a wedge. No, it's a stand wedge. there with a pitching wedge. So. Look at this. I got coffee. I know. And everything. Thank you, Christine. I'll be over here drinking right. coffee. If you want a quick sample of Rick's drumming, there's two things that you should start with. One is Peg by Steely Dan. And the other is uh, Hour That Morning Comes by James Taylor. And uh, that's just a great place to start among the, who knows, 10, 15, 20,000 recordings. Now, how do you know, Hour, that the morning comes? Because that's one of the more obscure ones. And I I did a couple of interviews where they asked me about discography stuff. Yeah. Sometimes when you do these interviews, I like when they say, we're going to do an interview with you and we want you to do 10 of your favorite songs by 10 different, you know, other drummers. Yeah. But sometimes you get the ones, and these are what I'm really bad at, is... 10 of your favorites that you did. And I I don't have an easy time with that. So Out of the Morning Comes on James's Dad Loves His Work album was one of them. And I did a, an interview about that. Next thing you know, I see it on social media. It starts stuff. trending. Yeah. yeah. Out of the Morning Comes. I thought, shit, you know, James should send me a check if uh-huh. he starts getting more record sales on that. Because that record... <laughs> That, that album sort of tanked, but that was a, that was a good session. It that was, was one of your ten favorites that you did. It was, yeah, it was because it was really different, and it almost didn't happen. Really? Yeah. I mean, if I'm making a, my favorite ten list, it's on it. I put that up there with Fifty Ways and Sissy Strut. Those are good. Yeah, those are good. Well, that's really nice of you to say. The other thing that I want to tell you is that. When I walked up, I saw you in the driveway, and you said, it's nice to see you. In my mind, I thought, oh, it's nice to see Rick Murata. You and I have met, though. We've met a couple times at NAMM shows in years past. So I don't know if that's just something you say to people, because you probably have met him at some point. Hey, it's nice to see you. No. I, but I, that's how I felt when I was going, like, hey, it's nice it was to see nice you, to too. It was nice to see you. <laughs> my first impression was the neighbor is trying to kick me out of, he's trying to kick me out of the street. <laughs> So in this studio, I'm going to describe it for our listeners because we're not doing video, but man, you've got some vaulted arches, beautiful exposed timbers. It looks like a birch. The people that were here before, she was a writer. Uh-huh. She was a screenwriter. Okay. And they tore the garage down and they built this uh, for her office. Oh, terrific. And that's why I kind of was excited about it because, you know, people have their home studios and things like that. I like to be separate, but close mm-hmm. and I just liked this vibe of this place, mm. and I brought my guy here, and I had him look at it to see because he, you know, he's first thing he's going to say is it's going to sound like shit, but he didn't. He came and said, "It's going to, it's going to be good." And then you see, I'll show you downstairs. But I don't have anything set up, but the drums are going to be down there, and it's it's good for playing. Sure. When I set the drums up, I have a sound I really like, and I start there, and I I just get everything set up. I I was testing the mics the other day, and and it's it's going to be good. Well, I went down there with Christina because I brought this table up from down there. And so I saw the riser. So I, I'm aware of what that setup is down there. You got a vocal booth right next to this room. So we're in the control room, which is a, this is a beautiful control room. I mean, it just, Thanks. it's airy. It breathes. Yeah, nice. It's light. There's natural nice daylight views, in here. There's palm trees out there. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Wafting in the breeze. Yeah. But then in the you middle have, of the valley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
you have the customary vocal booth with the glass door over here off to the side, and so you can track vocals from right here. Yeah. But when you got to go up and down stairs, no, we're gonna we're to gonna put it in. The, we're gonna talk the yeah walkie talkie or something. Okay. How about a live video feed? Yeah, we're gonna get that going. Okay, that's, that's easy though. I yeah, mean, you could FaceTime downstairs. Sure, absolutely, you could do that. It really, we've done that where I put up uh, the iPad or uh-huh. get on the computer and I just FaceTime. Uh huh. Well, you know when they do the the Academy Awards, the awards are at the wherever they Kodak are, Kodak or something, and the bands at Capitol, uh, at Capitol. Recording Studios. Oh wow. The the orchestra is no not idea. even in the same building half the time. Right. Yeah. Barely in the same town. Last year, I think Steve Jordan played. Wow. Have you done the Academy Awards? No, I have not. Oh, okay. Can you read to the point where you would get that gig? I can read to the point where they'd fire me from that gig. Oh, okay. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I can read, but yeah. you know what's... I mean, I, I don't read as well now as I did because I don't practice it all the you time. You haven't been called upon to do that well, year I did. Year. This right. year I did a couple of, of records that I was reading some stuff on that was a little difficult, but it was good. I mean, it was it was really good and wasn't wasn't hard to do. It was just the map is the hardest part about reading. I see. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. With the If the first time you look at it, the guys that do it every day, they look at the map and they know, okay, DS, Coda, repeat this three times, do this, go to the, you know, Del Seno. That's where I go, oh, Oh, there's the code. I forgot. There's mm-hmm. the DS. Where's the DS go to? Because I just have to look at the map first. But um, that takes practice. It, well, it just does. It's like doing it. It's like a bike. Yep. You're riding a bike, as they say. You know. You, oh yeah, right. I have to remember what the what all this other stuff is, not just the notes. But the thing is, my brother Jerry and I just had this conversation, and I just had this conversation with someone else recently. Let me just cut in. If listeners, if you don't know, uh, Rick has a younger brother, Jerry, who's also a session drummer. He's played with Peter Gabriel. Go look him up too. Okay, please proceed. So I was with him one day when I, we were a lot younger, and I had been working for this producer, and he wrote everything out. And he was a good, very good producer, very successful guy. And then he called my brother, and my brother was at my apartment in New York, and we were. I was there while he was on the phone with him, and he said, uh, "Yeah, this guy's going to call me for these sessions, and it's a lot of reading." I said, yeah, Jerry, you can read, you do, it's not, it's not difficult, it's pretty easy, the charts, the guy was very meticulous about the charts, but he said, yeah, I don't, he didn't have the confidence, you know, he didn't feel confident about reading, and he read, he played saxophone too, so I said, I don't understand why you wouldn't do that, and the guy called, and he was on the phone, and he was turning these, there were big sessions, it was either like a Gladys Knight session, or it was, could have been Diana Ross, could have been any of those, and he said, um, yeah, I'm sorry, man. I I just don't, I don't really I don't really read. I don't feel comfortable reading a chart. And I know the other guy, the guy on the other line, was saying to him, "Oh, don't worry about the charts. You know, it's going to be easy." Because I knew the guy, and I know, I know the kind of stuff That's he the would say. That's the kind of thing he would say. Yeah, of course. And my, my I remember my brother said, "You don't understand. I can't read the title of the song at the top of the chart." <laughs> He wanted him to know that he really didn't want to go into a room and read. And so he hung up the phone. He goes, "Rick." And he made a really good point. He said, if someone hires you to play on a session or me to play on a session, yes. why would they want us to play something that was written in black and white? Right. That's anybody, like reading a speech. Anybody that went to school, yeah. anybody that took Music 101 in, in high school can go and read those charts right. and play those parts. Mm-hmm. And he was completely right. And then when you go listen to his playing on... Peter Gabriel's records and on Indigo Girl records and on Paul McCartney records and then you hear, and you hear him on Elvis Costello records and a ton of other records that he did. You hear Jerry, you hear that that the stuff he creates when he plays. I mean, Shock the Monkey and the stuff he did on that album was completely groundbreaking. Yeah. Nobody would have ever told him to play that stuff ever in a million years. You'd never write that. No one else would write that. Well, the other thing is a lot of times when something is composed and somebody writes the drum part, they're not a drummer. No. They're writing what they should hear to keep time. But the other side of that is this. So years and years ago, I used to play with Johnny Winter and Edgar Winter. Right. And we did records together and I played live with them too. So Johnny would play and then... I would do a little t- bit of a tour with Johnny, who was only four pieces, and I would do White Trash with Edgar Winter. And Edgar, one time we were doing something, where we are going to work on one of Ed- Edgar's records, and he sat down and he says, I got this drum part. He didn't write it out. He sat down and played. Mm-hmm. 
this ridiculous drum part. I mean, so fucking scary. <laughs> I'm sitting down. He sits down. He goes, you know, and when Edgar sat down and played, I can almost remember how he looked. And if it was on video, he was playing it like this. Uh-huh. And I thought. Right now you look like a marionette. I thought. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. thought. That part was so left-handed. It was so backwards, kind of. Uh-huh. Okay. So he, he taught me the part. All right, and I tried to play it, and I tried to look like him when I played it, uh-huh. because I figured that might. Because I love the parts; it was so different drum part. That's a whole different thing. Someone puts that in front of you and says, "Try this." I want to try that, especially a guy that's not a conventional. You know, guys who were not real drummers were great at coming up with parts like that. That is a lot different, though, from sitting down with a pencil and a and a. You know, and writing and staff paper and writing out the thing that you want to keep time and accent the composition that you've done. He actually said, you know, let me just, there was a physical component that made the whole thing different. Yeah. So but there are a lot of guys that are like, there are guys that when you talk about writing and reading, I'm not that good of a reader. Mm-hmm. You get Vinnie Caliuto, Steve Gadd, um, guys like that, JR. like JR and Keith Carlock, guys like that. Sure. They read that we call fly shit. You know, yeah. <laughs> and, and they really do, and, uh-huh. and they'll make it work. The actual way when I read or have to read music now, I always thought of it as an actor would. Someone gives me sheet music if I'm doing a record. I look at it as a script. Now, I have to create a character, and I've said this, I said this just a few weeks ago. So when you walk in and you see a script, they hand it to you. It doesn't have... Might have what he looks like. He might have a limp. Mm-hmm. You know, all of that stuff. Then you create it in your head mm-hmm. as an actor, mm-hmm. and you do, you take that chance. You could walk out there and step all over your dick, or you could walk out there and create this character that's really great. I always thought of drum parts as characters. Oh. But it's fascinating. Do you, do you see yourself... Or see a character like you, you. You read the drum part. Do you see yourself actually playing the drums? Do you see you just no, no, hear it? no, no, no. It's not. It's not that that deep. I just try to make it so that anybody, like we were talking about, when you're reading, anybody can read that chart. Mm-hmm. You have to take that. It's like looking at a script, and there are words, and you look at the words, and you know if the writer is not in the room, you may say, "I'm going to change a couple of these words. I think it's going to sound." Sure. More norm, more like what someone yeah. would really or, say. Or this needs change, a pause. Or, or if you're changing. Or, right? You're, well, let's flip it and turn it on to you. I mean, if I hand you the sides from something and we go over it and I point the camera at you and you go, go. You know, I may have written this piece of dialogue as 57 words, but when you emote those 57 words, uh, you're, you're not visualizing yourself doing it, right? You are just coming from the core of you and emoting 57 words. Well, when I'm preparing or, pre- or rehearsing for or something like that, then I'm I'm picturing something. I'm picturing everything around me. Mm-hmm. Really, I'm not like watching. I'm not like having an out of body experience. And um, I, but I'd imagine, you know, you're you're hearing the other instruments, right? I mean, because I, I usually go through and I think if they give you adjectives, like they call it parentheticals, which I think sometimes are important. I guess yeah. I only played the trumpet when I was a kid. So as far as like reading music, you know, there was like dolce. I mean, there's like all these little Italian adjectives that right. told you how to, how to play it. Right. And um. But as an actor, you can kind of slide on those a little bit and kind of feel with what's going on right. around you. But you're saying that are there actually directions like in a like in a written written script or written composed music for you, like telling you how to play it? Oh, there's all there's yeah. all, all all sorts of things if you yeah. really look. I just never <laughs> I mean, thought about. It. I just never thought about the drums. <laughs> there's the drum dotted eight notes or whatever. And, yeah. There's there's forte. There's piano. Mezzo piano. It's 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 all sorts of different things that they that they say that we don't pay attention. Right. But um, I think the point though is that when we have a, an opportunity to to make a record and we want to get the voice of Rick Morata on the drums, we don't want. Hey, here's I want you to play this exactly like this, Rick, because I could get anybody to do that. Right. What I want is here, sit here and let's lay lay in this groove for a minute and. And then something's going to happen to the way that you play the hi-hat or something's going right. to happen to where you lay in grace notes or something, you know, maybe you're laying back on the backbeat or whatever 
makes it your voice. Well, I'm always your... laying back on the back. I don't, See? If I have to jump ahead of the backbeat, I'm, I'm in trouble. It's not, yeah. My natural thing is just, that's one of the things that I, that I was known for is being so laid back. Yeah. And I don't try. I just, it's what I do. That's how you, you do it. If you say to me, Rick, do me a favor, play it on the right side of the beat. I'll go, I don't know, really know how to do that. This is, just for Mark and for our listeners, this would be like handing a script to Morgan Freeman and saying, here, read this. I need you to go through this fast. And Morgan Freeman would say, I don't, I don't go through it fast. I'm going to read this like Morgan Freeman, and it's going to sound well, you know, like this, right? So it's, but the interesting thing is, I think that, I think that the, more, the more natural thing for guys like us to say, I learned over the years, I used to say, do that. Now I just say, okay, uh-huh. and I just do and what I have do to do. What, yeah. Because... <laughs> Bottom line is, if you if you do what you're doing, and you, if if you do it and it sounds good, you're doing it right. Sometimes people want to direct you in certain ways, and they don't really have they don't what they're thinking and they're saying are two completely different things. Uh-huh. So, or they don't are, know are, exactly what's good for. But them. there are times I've been on set. I, I have no problem walking into a session, and listening to someone play something down, which is more normal. Yeah, which is more of what I like to do. You know, there's a chart, a chord chart. Mm-hmm. And and I'll just write in little things. Right. And somebody plays, and I have no problem saying, I have no idea what to play on this. Because I want it to be interesting. You mm-hmm. can play backbeats, you can play cross stick, you can play brushes. But I want it to be interesting. And and like, for example, you said uh, that the, the, um, the uh, hour that the morning comes, the reason I like it, it's complete ego shot for me because... There's nobody going to play what I played on that. That's absolutely true. And, and and it was a big. It was it was one of those things where James came in. It's on a James Taylor record, by the way. James comes in and he plays the song. I've and, got it right here. You know, James is an he's an unbelievable and interesting and unique guitar player. Yeah, very different. When he plays it, so I'm listening to James, and I've I worked with him so much back then that I listened to this thing and I started hearing this thing. In the background, and this is what I was talking about earlier to Mark, saying what I was trying to relate to him about that whole acting thing. I hear this character sort of flitting around underneath, but not, not just like sort of not not uh-huh. Jack DeJanet free, okay. where it's it's incredibly beautiful and unbelievably musical, but there's it's nothing repetitive. This was because I'm a backbeat player. This was something that was I just felt it was it would go, go like this, you know. Duh, 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 duh. But on inside of all of that stuff, mm-hmm. all of this rocking, back and forth, is this other little sort of this gentle sway. That's right. Yeah, and it happens over and over again, and it's very simple and incredibly complicated at the same time. That's why I had a ball with that. But the interesting story about that was when we did that track. Everybody loved it. Peter Asher loved it. Everybody said. Man, this is so great. This is really interesting. It sounds really interesting. And the guys in the band, all A players. Yeah. All love, you know, we're all loving it. In walks Danny Korchmar, who I love, is a very dear old friend and played with James from the very beginning. They were in bands together. Danny goes, James, come here. That track's great. That's a great song, but that drum part is too crazy. You can't, it's just not going to work. And he says, Danny. Danny. Danny says, and I'm like, I mean, I remember going, fuck, well, I'm dead. Here yeah. we go. I really like that part, and I really want that to go. To stay, yeah. James walks in and says, you know what, guys? We have to recut hour that the morning comes. I said, seriously? And then what can I say? You know, I'm in the band. Yeah. We were in a band. I was in James's band, and I wasn't just a studio guy. We're trying to be like a band. Okay, everybody has something to say about it. And everybody's like, Why? Yeah. Sounds great. But Cooch was, was really convinced him. So and Peter Asher walks in and he goes nuts. He says, are you crazy? This is great. This is a great drum part. This is, makes the song. Okay. It's James's record. Yeah. So we re- came back and we cut the whole thing. Boom. That's all I played. I just play, and I tried. Yeah. It's not like I tr- I tried I tried to screw it up on purpose. I played it yeah. the way you would normally play the track. Uh-huh. And it was clean and professional and everything. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And never at the end of the whole thing, everybody just went, 
this is so not working. Yeah. We're going back to, and I, I was totally shocked because I thought that thing was so left-handed. I thought, yeah, they're not going to let me keep, they're not going to keep that on that record because it's a commercial record, yeah. but it was, it really worked and it's great. And now, you know, people are starting to bring that up and that album was very, was very rarely heard. And every once in a while I see it posted and Peg, I see right now because of, it's in, it's interesting. Walter just passed away yeah. from Steely Dan. So people are posting, talking a lot about Steely Dan and there's a lot of Peg that whole making of Peg and the song Peg and all of that is being like every day I get something. Somebody sends me, I get three or four things a day yeah. from that. And so that was another track that was, I was kind of. Everybody go look that up. The making of Peg uh, on YouTube. It's a great video. It's the clip's about 15 minutes long and it starts with you and you talk about the making of Peg. Uh, I grew up in the Bay area. There's a show when I was in high school called the TV 20 dance party. And the, they would throw a high school dance the local tv station would throw a high school dance and when it was your high school's day you know you'd go watch it and you'd see all your friends and you'd be you know everybody got dressed up and stuff and then they would feature a band from the school and the school would you know whatever band was there uh i went to hogan high school and uh, the band that we had was called truant my was wife went high to school high. it was a high school yeah it was just the you know a band if you're there were kids in the high school that had a band. You would get featured on the local TV show. Oh, I see what you're saying. So, and they would just come out and play a song or two. And my wife's high school, the band played Peg. Oh, really? And, you know, when you listen to it, they got the broad strokes. The problem with the song Peg is it's all in the subtleties. Mm. And everybody's part is ridiculous. Mm. Your part was ridiculous on that, oh. on that track. Chuck Rainey's part was everybody's part was ridiculous. So if you hear the 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 da 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 it's okay. Yeah, that sounds easy enough. But when you take the part in total, everybody's part was crazy. Yeah, it was great. And to hear it broken down and to hear like the seven or eight guitar solos that didn't make the cut, that it's fifteen brilliant minutes if you guys are into the making of. I just music read. Stuff. I just out. read this morning, Newsweek. Mm-hmm. You know, Steve Kahn just emailed me a couple of days ago, and he's playing rhythm guitar on that. Uh-huh. And he said this writer from Newsweek was wanting to talk to me about Peg. So I said, okay, fine. But I think the article came out already because I saw it posted. And they were talking to Steve Kahn, who played a guitar solo. Yeah. Walter played a guitar solo. Mm-hmm. Skunk Baxter. Probably Skunk played a solo. Yeah. Robin Ford played a solo. Wow. I'm surprised. I'd be shocked if Larry Carlton didn't play a solo, sure. but they didn't mention Larry. Okay. And Jay Graydon played that that final the solo. The one that made the cut. Yeah. Uh-huh. And they were talking. And Rick Derringer, who, by the way, played guitar in Johnny Winter's band when I played with Johnny and with Edgar. When I played with Edgar, he would come and play with us sometimes. Wow. He was one of the guitar solos on it. I didn't even know that. Wow. And he's a great guitar player, too. How much money did they throw at, specifically Steely Dan Records back then? Because, I mean, you just threw out seven or eight session guys who you'd be elated to make a record with one of them. Right. And Donald and Walter would go in the studio and they'd get one from everybody, it seemed like. Well, for example, on Peg, one of the things, it's all studio. They, They say studio bands, but the truth is, I played in bands with every guy that played on on Peg. Sure. We, I was on the road for two and a half years with Chuck Rainey. Mm-hmm. Chuck and I knew how to play with. The, we were we played like this together. Yeah, we thought alike when we played. We had played probably. We probably played that groove with Roberta Flack someplace out in you know God knows where on tour. Yeah, or in some other gig, we did something similar to that, but nobody ever heard it. Uh-huh. It's interesting, you know. You play. On a hit record, you play something that you've played a dozen times, and it's all of a sudden it's new and famous, and it's it's great. It's and hit. I'm I'm lucky that that I'm very lucky that Peg came out and was such a huge hit because I feel happy for having played that part. Mm-hmm. I remember that session, and I was doing so many sessions back then. I don't remember much of any of them, but I remember that one. Wow! I remember Don Grolnick, mm-hmm. and I remember. The guys on the date, and I, and I remember Chuck and I just looking at each other, you know, like looking over the goals at each other, going, 
oh yeah, yeah. We I know what this we're is good do here. Yeah. And and they didn't never tell us what to play. Sure. They put there's a perfect example. Donald and Walter put charts up all the time. They always had an, an arranger put up the charts. And it was a map. Yeah. Sometimes I'd be looking at a bass part, not a drum chart, just yeah. a bass part. But just so you knew where the changes were. And or what, you knew what the accents were. Yeah. Mostly that. Or a horn part. Like a lot of times trumpet players play. If you had a, if you were doing a session and there were horn parts, usually the trumpet players play. They'd say, give the drummer a trumpet part. because right. So you can accent that. Because those are the hits. the hits. Yeah. You could follow the bar line. You know what you're going to play through the bar lines. You know, dig it, dig it, dig it, dig it. And then uh-huh. that's, ah, 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 ah. That's the kind of stuff that, that we did on all those. On, on the Steely Dan dates, that's the way it was too. Yeah. You know, on um, on ASCAP about 10 years or so ago, they honored Steely Dan, the Beverly Hilton Hotel. So they called me and a couple other guys that played in the band, in various versions of the band, and they said, would you come in and play? And it would be me, and Mike McDonald played, uh, sang, and we did Peg, I think, and um, John Beasley and Neil Steubenhaus, but guys who had worked with Donald and Walter yeah. over the years. And of course, Mike McDonald who had worked with them forever. And, so, and Mike sang the, the lead parts, and, and Donald and Walter were in the audience, and they wanted them to speak. But Donald and Walter said to them, we'd really like Rick Murata to speak for us. <laughs> and it was, my, it was the, one of the most fun days I had because I just told people stories about what it was like to play with Steely Dan. And the great thing about those guys is Walter and Donald, both Walter had and Donald has, amazing sense of humor. And you could tell from their very cynical. Right. Uh, They've got that really cynical New York sense really of humor. Smart, really smart, but dry. they're really funny guys. Yeah. I mean, really funny. And we all got each other's sense of humor. We were all really good friends. Uh-huh. So I just told real irreverent stories about the making of like, a Steely Dan. <laughs> I talked about Don't Take The first time I ever worked with them was on Don't Take Me Alive. And I told them the whole thing about the, the session and what it was like. And the place went crazy it was like a, there were about six or eight hundred people there and they were all laughing yeah and they said we all want in on the inside joke at the end um they said walter slid under the table he was laughing so hard <laughs> man you didn't start playing until you were 19 years old right so all of the lessons that you get when you're playing in high school the rudiments and the you know like you you mentioned the sight reading and the learning how to be told what to do. Yeah, none of that. None of you were in. I had already by gone away to college and came back. Didn't have any idea what I was doing. Yeah, I had gone to Alabama for a year from New York, and I came back. Didn't know what I was going to do. Did you come back and go? What in the hell was I thinking when I went down there? No, 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 no. I was ready to go back because I I had just been away from home for basically the first time. I was seventeen when yeah. I went. Came back and then my father said, "You're not going back down there. I'm not going to pay money for you to go down there. You're just fucking around." Yeah. Because I really didn't know what I was going to do. And then I, I started going to school locally. You know, I went to college, right, in New York. Okay. And then I... And then where, I st- where in New York? From the city or from... No, right out... Where? Westchester, right okay. outside the city. And then I... Somebody of mine got drafted in the Army. He was a drummer. And I said... His name was Billy Reed. And I said, Billy, what are you going to do with your drums when you're gone? Are you going to leave those behind? <laughs> Why don't you leave them with me? I'll watch him. He said, That's what a great idea. He said, what a great idea. He was going to Germany. Yeah. So he said, what a great idea. Yeah, Rick, you hold on to him until I get back. He's gone for two years. Uh-huh. He comes back and you're playing with Edgar Winter. <laughs> <laughs> he came I back and I, well, exactly I had, a gig. Like that, I had to but... give him his drums back. That was the drag. Now I had to go buy drums. Wow. But no, I had gotten other drums, but I, I, I held on to his his blue Gretsch. I think it was a blue Gretsch kit. Did you guys stay in touch? Pearl. Yeah, well, we, I hear from him every once in a while, yeah. Okay. He still lives there, and my brother... Tommy, my youngest brother, plays, I think, plays in a band with him a lot. My oh, brother's, good. My brother's a bass player and, and, and a drummer as well. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to hear that he knew what came of his stint away and that he left you with the drums. Oh, yeah. He, he's one of the 40 guys that takes credit for my career. <laughs> but the, really th- the thing that happened was the guy he played with was a guy named Dave Spinoza, who I grew up with, who's a guitar player, and he's a monster. He was really one of the great guitar players of our generation. Yeah. And Dave said, you know, if you play drums, because I used to dance a lot when they would play, I was a dancer. He said, you know, if you play drums, you'd play in my band. And about two months later, I was playing in a band with Dave after I started playing drums. Uh-huh. 
So he had some sense because you were a dancer that, hey, this guy would play drums in a dance band and he would get it. Oh, yeah. Is that what it was? Yeah, he, he did. And he also was, if you don't know who Dave Spinoza is, if you look him up, he's, his discography is ridiculous. He produced the Dad Loves His Work, the, not the Dad Loves His Work, the uh, Walking Man album, the first James Tam- Taylor album I did. He, oh, okay. he produced and arranged and played guitar on. Huh. But he played guitar on. He played guitar on the Dr. John Right Place Wrong Time that guitar solo. Yeah. A famous guitar player. That's Dave. And he played he was the first guy when Paul McCartney had left the Beatles um and they he did a solo album. Dave was the he auditioned every guitar player I think in the world and Dave was the guitar player on the Ram album. It was Dave and then Hugh McCracken. Wow. So the, these guys were, they were number one call guitar players. Nice guys to hang around if you want to make some I grew music. up, but David and I were roommates on the road when we were kids. I mean, it was crazy. We yeah. had a great time. It was We were really best friends when we grew up. So when we started playing, I played in a band with him, and he didn't even play guitar most of the time in the band. He sang and danced, and it was like a R&B bands we were in at that time. And he was he wrote all the charts and everything. That's how I learned to read. He taught me how to read. I see. Because he would write the charts in the band, and he'd say, that's a dotted quarter note, and he'd explain what it was, and he'd say, here's a Charleston. And then a bass player I knew gave me a book by Bugs Bauer called Rhythms. It was a bass player, uh-huh. and I was doing sessions with him, and I would, I would screw up in the session, and he came up to me. He was an older guy. His yeah. name was Russell George. He was an old jazzer, but he was playing on a lot of sessions in New York, and he came up to me, and he said, hey, man, here, read this book. When you get to the end of this book, and it was a bass book, yeah, he just said, "Play these figures on the drums," and that's what I used to practice every day. He said, "When you, when you get to the end of this book, you can play anything," and it was pretty every much bass right. Player will love you. <laughs> you, you will be you, able to lock in with well, everybody. I'll be able to make the hits. Yeah. It was basically it was all about it was just bass parts, you know, uh-huh. play the bass part and then make the hits with the bass player. Yeah, but that's where I learned how to read. Andy Newmark also showed me a lot. He showed me all the rudiments because I grew up with Andy Newmark. Okay. Andy had, he was leaving to do Carly Simon's record. Wow. Oh. And when we grew up, though, he was, I was 19, he was 17 or 18, and he was already playing in all these bands, and he was great. Wow, oh, yeah. And uh, Andy could read anything, and he could play anything, and he was really a studied drummer. He, we, were, we were roommates when we were 20. We were roommates in a, in a hotel in, in Larchmont, New York, and he'd get really pissed off because I would get called to do gigs, and I didn't know how to play a paradiddle as well as he did. Right. He was superior in other ways, <laughs> yes, and you did. had a, some kind of groove that he wanted. It. He hated it. Yeah. He really did. What's Andy Newmark up to nowadays? He lives in, he's been living in London for really a long time. I see. And uh, he's been... He works sometimes with Brian Ferry and Roxy Music, and he also does other gigs around there. You know, he worked a lot with Clapton, and he worked with a lot of different guys. Then he was doing the London production of the um, Julie Taymor uh, play, Lion King. Andy Newmark, he's been away from the States for a while now. Oh, yeah. If you could say that your starting to play at 19 colored your uh, playing or made your voice different from everybody else's what uh what do you think is the main thing the, the main lack difference? of the lack of fundamental training and and in your case now see here's the thing is that i'm reluctant to tell people uh yeah don't get fundamental training no 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 no, because, no 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 because that's not no 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 yeah no that's not what i'm saying at all yeah the first thing i did was learn how to play mustang sally okay okay great great place to start a Wilson Pickett song. You yeah. know, play Mustang Sally or play uh, something else he did. Uh-huh. <clears throat> then go out and sat in playing Mustang Sally in a gig that Andy Newmark was doing. Okay. And was scared out of my mind. Thanks, Andy. But that was the groove. Guys heard me play and somebody said, man, want to play? Let's play. We're going to jam this week. Okay. Then I started jamming. Then I started to work as a drummer. And went back and learned everything I didn't know. That's when I went back and sat with Andy for hours practicing um, rudiments. and everything else. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And and that's when I went back and started reading. I did it ass backwards. Uh-huh. But the thing that worked for me was I didn't have the, the rules, the paint-by-numbers thing in my head when I started. Yeah. I just said... 
This is what I want to do. I want to play a backbeat. I want to play a downbeat with my right foot. I want to play a backbeat with my left hand. And I want to play quarter notes or eighth notes with my right hand. Uh That's all I wanted to do. If I got my left foot to go up and down on two and four on the hi-hat or someplace else, I was happy as a pig in shit. Uh Yeah. So then then Andy comes in and gives me this Alan Dawson independence book. And it threw all that shit out the window uh. because now I'm thinking about independence. And so we would work on independent stuff. And Andy was real independent in, yeah. into independence. The only thing I found about independence that became a little bit of a, a distraction or hazardous is sometimes I would see guys that would work on independence so well that when they would play, it sounded like they were playing three different songs at the same time. Yeah, their joints weren't locked into each other. No, they were not. I prefer the concept of interdependence. And that's great. That's you know what? That's a really great. That's I haven't heard put that way, and that's what I'm going to steal from you. All right, Rick Morata stealing something from me. I where I really figured out that your body should be. It's not the fact that you can play something independent of your other three limbs. It's they all should be working together as playing a bossa nova. Yeah. And just leaving that, you know, like my when I learned it, I learned it from a guy named Ken Elisorio. He was my teacher, may he rest in peace. He would just say, you gotta your kick drums gotta go dum 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 and that's gotta stay there. But you can't have it stay there to the point where your other limbs are God knows where and that's still doing that. You got to have everything tied together so that when you accent stuff, yeah. everything's, you know, everything's working together. But Well, we used to listen to guys like Andy. I remember Andy brought this this uh, record in one day. He goes, oh, we got to listen to this band, uh, Redbone. And oh, the, yeah, I remember Redbone. They were American they were Indians. A, a, a funky Native American band. <sighs> Man, they were funky. And that Are you drummer, familiar with the band Redbone? No, I gotta look them up. Before That's your, an obscure before reference. Your time. They were a gigantic band, too. They were like the Navajo Earth, Wind, and Fire. Yeah. But they were their drummer. I remember Andy and I used to listen to it, and I go, Andy, I can't. What the hell is he playing? And he would play, he had amazing groove stuff, but very independent, sort of like the meters. That stuff worked, but sometimes when there was too much independence going on, it, it just didn't flow for me. Yeah, I love Terry Bozio. Yeah. Uh, but man, he gets out there. Well, he's got more drums. There. Now, do you know who Terry Bozio is? No. He played with Zappa. He played in his, a band called... Uh, Missing Persons. Missing Persons, who was oh, yeah. his wife at the time. Walking and, in L.A. Uh-huh. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> he's a great... Drummer, and he's a rolling. I always used to think of him as a rolling drummer. I went to see him play live. Uh, it was a rehearsal, and I, I I ran into Terry somewhere. It was a long time ago, and he was doing a, a live gig with he was with Mick Jagger. Okay, and uh, they, I was there for the rehearsal or something. And uh, he's a rolling rolling kind of drummer. Yeah. but he also now has. We were just talking about Terry the other day. He has on stage. The biggest drum kit I've ever seen in my entire life. It's like a city. No, it's, no, like it's a not long even. Shot. Just, you have to look. At, you have to see a picture of it. You can't describe it because there are so many drums that you don't know how one human can hit them all in one day, or even yeah. remember where they all are. Drums and cymbals and bass drums. The thing about uh, his playing that uh, back then, when he was still playing a lot of grooves. He is a really fluid, really funky. Yeah. You know, he's got a great backbeat yeah. that lays back. Yeah. I saw him one time with Jeff Beck. Uh-huh. It was the guitar shop record. And it was uh Jeff Beck and Terry Bozio and Tony Hymas. And I remember watching that show and just being blown away because he was really busy and it was amazing. It's just like a feat of dexterity watching him play the drums. And then in the middle of the solo, he just laid back on two and four for about, you know, I mean, like a couple measures. And that little groove, and then he went back into something else, but that Mm. little groove hit so hard. Mm. And I remember thinking, just do that for a little longer. Mm. But uh, Yeah, no, I've seen him do that. I mean, I've seen him. He... You have to play what this guy I used to work with, trumpet player, used to say, play the room. You got to play what is appropriate for what you're playing. Yeah. And you nowadays, know? it's just that Terry Bozio is going to show up by himself because uh, yeah, he plays he's got everything. so much to say. Yeah. That I'm just pulling up a picture for Mark's sake. I'm going to start playing the trumpet again. Here you go.
Oh, wow. Yeah. Good God, huh? It's a lot of drums. Jeez, look at that. I want to have this guy to... <laughs> so, yeah, his tech. He he can't have one just one guy. It's like a kitchen. Yeah, it's like a chef. There's you know? so much happening. I want to shift gears. I, man, I could do this with you all all weekend. But uh, we don't want to bore people with this shit. Though. Yeah. <laughs> we don't. Yeah. Let's get Mark before we, we get Mark falling Talk asleep. about something that's well. Let's me. let's talk about your what? film scoring and what you're up to nowadays and what because you go from being a guy who didn't even play music until he was 19 years old to then you become a drummer and a sought after session player and this is what I spent my days doing look at this chords there there's chords here and so you're teaching yourself how to play piano there's, so you can there's these there's writing and oh, right. I gotta refresh my memory on how to rem- I just have to have this stuff around all the time because if I'm writing something I have to go Jesus, what's the key signature? What, got what? Like plastic cards. It's one says the essentials of music. It's like <laughs> it's like the equivalent of flashcards, right? You know, and you got a guy here who makes music for TV shows that are enormous hits. You bought a house and he's got for flash your cards. <laughs> <laughs> and you got an essentials of music laminated card <laughs> sitting here. Whatever it takes. Yeah, man. That's whatever it takes, man. Oh, so you, you don't. I mean, you started playing the. Get on, what, what are your other instruments? I mean, there's like the, yeah. you know, you play the drums, and then what did you evolve to once you started composing? Well, I started b- playing drums, then I was playing bass. Right. And then I I haven't picked up a bass in so many years because I have the weirdest thing that happens to me. So I'll be I'll get interested in something, and I'll, I'll work on it, and then I'll lose it. For right. example, my, I had this amazing bass that if I had it now, it would be worth a lot of money. It was one of the first... Precision basses, the um, Fender Precision bass yeah. sunburst with a rosewood neck. Uh, and a guy I went to high school bought it, and he put it in his closet and never played it once. Right. And he said, Rick, you're doing music. What are you thinking about playing bass? I said, you know, I'm looking for a bass. He goes, I'm going to sell my bass. I'll give it to you for 200 bucks." And I bought this bass. It's unbelievable. It played itself. So yeah. I'm playing all the time, and I was starting to get really good. Chuck used to come in, and I'd be ripping some of his shit, and he would get he go like, where are you, how are you doing this stuff? I went out on the road, I came back, my brother picked me up at the airport, he says, I got bad news, your place got broken into today. Oh. Everything was stolen. Wow. All, everything. The tape, all my studio stuff, everything. In the day I was coming home, I was gone for months. The day. Had that you... day it happened, that day. Uh. And Jerry came, he wanted to tell me, so he picked me up at the airport, Yeah. and he said, I just got to break this news to you before we go up because it was my apartment in New York and I had a house up in the, uh, about an hour out of the city and that's where I had everything yeah they went into the house and they just took it all and I never could replace that base that P-base. and then I lost I lost you know, my, my house got ripped off I was in Venice I was away working on a show I came back home the back door was open I thought oh no so I walked in sure enough the TV's gone the computer is gone. Uh, there's a drawer with, you know, watches, whatever. That stuff's gone. But it's like, they didn't take my Martin guitar. And I was like, you... <laughs> and I was I was actually... Uh, first of all, I was like, kind of felt violated when somebody rips you off. Then I went through this whole feeling of being offended. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you mean they didn't take the, the guitar? guitar. <laughs> you fucking idiots. <laughs> you know? You're scaring me a, now. I'm going to go back and put the alarm on my house right now. And it's right across the street. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is not... It uh, was not fun. Wow. So anyway, I was playing bass, and then I started playing piano uh, because I wanted to just sit and fancied myself as like, I wanted to learn chords. I don't want to learn anything. Everything is simple for me. I never really wanted to learn to do all acrobatic stuff. I just want to do really nice changes, and mm-hmm. then I started writing. And then when I would write, I would do the most basic writing, and then I'd bring in somebody that really does it. Like if somebody's... A guy like if if a guy who's not a drummer sits down and says, "I got this demo of a track that I just did. Here's the part, but just listen to the song and play what you would play. That's yeah. what I do. Yeah. I'll I'll write something, I'll play it, and then I'll have someone come in that's much better than me as a piano player right. to play the to nuance. execute the idea. Yeah, of course. Right. So when you're, you're you're working as a composer now, so you you work. No, with- I actually, yeah, I I do, I did, I have, but it's been sort of an evolution. It's I don't know what I'm going to work on next as a composer. I've been doing this children's stuff for for my friends, Mr. Clown Show, and and that's been kind of fun. I also 
you know, I did Everybody Loves Raymond, and I did some TV shows and our episodics and some movies. But the movies, I got really pigeonholed. Once you do anything in this business, I don't know what it's like for you. And I don't know what it's like for you. But you get pigeonholed. Mm -hmm. So here I am. I want to write a movie score with an orchestra. So I'm biting off a lot. I'm like, here's a drummer who's coming out, and I'm going to just, I want to write for orchestra, for full orchestra. Oh, nobody's going to let you do that. Why don't you just produce some records? Okay, I've done that. I could do that, and I, I want to write for an orchestra, and I want to learn how to do it. It's not, it's not easy, but you just all you have to do is the basics, and you get an orchestrator. Well, I got a hit show with Everybody Loves Raymond. Yeah. And as it's as big a hit as could be on TV, really. And that's all anybody sees you as. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember I worked with, I've known Carly Simon since we were in our 20s. Andy Newmark, I met her when I was 21. And we've been best friends. And I've worked with Carly over the years. I've gone on tour. I've toured with her. I've done album after album with her. I play drums. She lives on Martha's Vineyard. That's how I ended up on Martha's Vineyard. So. We're working on one of her records one a few years ago, and I'm in the and now she doesn't ever leave the house. So we we go to the house and I sit down and I um, I'm playing piano and during between stuff, whatever song we're doing, and then I'll go over and I'll sit down and I start looking at the chart and okay, you know we're going like this. Oh, I like the way these changes are going. And she would say, Rick, just don't sit behind a piano, okay? It just doesn't look right. It just doesn't look right. <laughs> <laughs> you want to wow. Yeah. What? Just, I can't. She, she, and then I think Ben, her son, said, What's the mom? What's the problem? She said, I, I, I just can't see Rick doing anything but playing the drums. Uh, if I see him behind the piano, I get uncomfortable. I think he's going to break it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think she was afraid I was going to try to come up with a part and play it on the record. I really do. Or, or say, hey, we should go on the road. I'm going to play piano. <laughs> <laughs> what Hall & Oates tracks did you play on? Oh, God. That was on the first Abandoned Luncheonette album. It was, you know, this has been one of those things. I don't remember what tracks, but the two drummers on that record, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. were Bernard Purdy and me. There were a few records where the two drummers were you and Bernard, Bernard Purdy. Bernard Purdy, yeah. And, you know, the first Steely Dan album I did was Bernard Purdy and me, and there was an article that came out in the Village Voice in New York, and it said, they said they had talked to Bernard about this album. And Bernard went out of his way to say, it says there are two drummers on the record, but it's really me playing everything. Oh, come on. So, so I called the Village Voice. I was pissed. Uh -huh. I knew Bernard really, really well. I, I've known him for years, and he's an inspiration. The guy is, he's a god. Yeah, you know, he's, he's amazing. He invented a lot of that shit based off the old ska stuff, that it was his, you know, his roots. Yeah. And uh, I called the writer up <laughs> voice and i said that's not true i played on uh, at least don't take me alive he goes well bernard said that it was him on everything i said okay go listen again and then he called this guy called um bernard. someone no no he oh. called someone at the record company or or the one of the producers one of donald and walt he got through to somebody and he called me back he said, i'm really sorry we're printing a retraction because they verified. Yeah, but then uh, now I don't care about that stuff at all. Yeah. There's been so much stuff that I've been on that I, I didn't get any credit on. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Well, and then not only that, but I mean, there's so many things that we can see you on where, you know, your your yeah. contribution to the way that we hear music nowadays. Remember is, me and Julio so down by the schoolyard? Yeah. Okay. That bass player is the bass player I was telling you about that gave me the book. Okay. That was Russell George. All right. Dave Spinoza is playing guitar. Uh -huh. Ayrton Morero is playing percussion and okay. i'm playing drums the record comes out it's a huge hit i get the album it says there's no rick Murata on it i saw paul i go paul killing me what happened <laughs> uh -oh. took my name he goes he says rick we took, took your part off the record i'm listening to the fucking part <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice try paul what are you gonna do nice try I understand. It didn't really matter at the time. You know, at the time, it really mattered a lot to me, but it didn't. It doesn't matter in the long run. No one's going to care. Okay. Well, I don't know. I'd say a lot of us care. Well, did, was there a little strange Paul McCartney? 
wanted to make it a real point that the Beatles songs were, were written by him. Was it like four years ago or something? Four or five years ago? W which Beatles songs were met, written by him? Yeah, he wanted to really delineate. He wanted to really delineate. I think it was it had something to do with their residuals or whatever. This was, had to be, I'll bet you money, it was more to do with the publishing and Yoko. Yeah. Yoko was very... Proprietary? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And she was really, she would do a lot of interviews and stuff. I remember back when I was doing, I did I was in that Plastic Ono band for a while and did work with John and with Yoko. And she had a lot, she was doing a lot of stuff where she was talking about Paul. And that was when Paul and John were kind of estranged. And I think she had gotten in the middle of all that stuff. I don't remember, but I, I think if there's any reason Paul would do it, because I don't think he's that kind of a guy. I think mm -hmm. it's finally he's like fed up with it because yeah. he didn't want to address it as being a regular original Beatle, I believe. And um, but but actually Jerry would mo know more about that because Jerry did work with Paul. Well, Jerry did an album with him, did one or two albums with Paul McCartney. Okay. But the only time I worked with Paul, I sang with him <laughs> on a James Taylor record. Wow. Uh, he and I sang background parts together. But what's it like hearing his voice? <laughs> what's that? You just want to stop and like listen to him if he's singing next to you. Yeah, well, I was a little intimidated because I'm singing background with James Taylor, Paul McCartney, Linda McCartney, and somebody else. And I got Paul and James on either side of me, and I'm going, what am I doing here? And I was just singing the bass player. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking that right now. I'm looking around at your studio going, Gee, I'm in Rick. I'm Rick well, there's a bunch of people studio. I want to ask you about. But I was wondering about your... You, uh, with Jim Croce, did you oh yeah, yeah, yeah. With him? I mean, I play. I, you know, I'm kind of one of these guys that can listen to a song and I can kind of learn some chords and play it. But I love his songs, but they're so hard. Just really, to pick up and play. Yeah, I don't. He know. was the. He was. There's something unique about. Them. Yeah, just the storytelling aspect and the way how you, that you could get. He's into a storyteller. A, you could get drawn into a Jim yeah. Croce yeah. song. You know, when I first first heard him and I first worked with him, I didn't really. You know, I come from R&B background. That's my roots. So when I'm first working with Jim, here's a folk guitar player, mm -hmm. singer. But I really got into the music and to his stuff and really enjoyed playing with it. And the guys that produced him, Terry Cashman and Tommy West, were his producers. So it was just the five of us in the studio, Maury, the guitar player, Jim, me, and those two guys. They were great. They were great sessions to do because it's like, it's like this. It's like hanging out like this. Mm -hmm. Should we play something? Oh, my yeah, God, oh yeah. yeah, let's go play something. I thought you were serious. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> That's the way it was. We'd be hanging out, and then we'd go play. You know, one somebody would say, don't you think we should do something? We would do it. Yeah. The weekend that Jim was killed in the plane crash, mm -hmm. I was flying to L.A. that following week. He and I had just worked together, and he said, Maury and I are going to, I'm going to San Diego, and we're going to be in L.A., so let's hang out when we get to L.A. Great. I was in Massachusetts. I don't know how they tracked me down. This is before cell phones or anything. I was in a rental house with my buddy, Hugh McCracken, and his wife and my buddy Spinoza. And we were racing motorcycles up there or something. We were at some event. And John Tropez was with us, I think, at the time. And the phone rings, and McCracken says to me, hey, it's for you. It's... Um, Tommy West. Yeah, I just want to tell you before it hits, we wanted to let you know that Jim and Maury were in a plane crash and died. I almost fell over. And I was just supposed to see those guys. It was really shocking, and it lends to one of the reasons I'm so phobic about flying. I, I don't like flying very much. Wow. And, uh, you know, it was really scary because those guys got on this little plane and started to to go wherever they were going and the plane crashed and it's like the big bopper and things like that. Don't yeah. do that shit, you know? Yeah. And it was a drag. But Jim was great, great to work with and a great guy and just a down-to-earth, great, all-around guy. And I love to be able to say that. And I love that, that you ask about him because not everybody even remembers or, you know, I sometimes I feel really bad. I saw, I was watching a movie or something recently and there was a Jim Croce poster on the wall in the background. But it was a present day yeah. show. I don't know what it was. And I thought, how great is that? Somebody, obviously, and when you do those things, you know that somebody, one of the producers, writers, or somebody knew who it was and wanted 
So and there's to always a reason when they this, put these pictures up there. Sure. Somebody says, "I love Jim no, Croce. I want somebody." Who, to think, way, Jim this Croce, this like character he, is this cool. But he wasn't as long, he wasn't around long enough that the pictures of him are just iconic. Like there's the cover of the album where he's sitting on a stool. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's the one picture right. of Jim Croce. I think. And you know those pictures? Did you ever see pictures of him with that? Just the cigar in its mouth. Is it the one where he's wearing a hat too? Well, he always had a, this guinea sticker sticking oh, out of his mouth. Cigarillo or something. Yeah, yeah, but it was one of those old Italian chew 'em up cigars. You know, they're not like oh, yeah. not like big yeah. Cuban cigars. They're these little cigarillos, or they called them. We used to call them guinea stinkers because I'm Italian. <laughs> guinea stinkers. I, I'm Italian. <laughs> I could say that. <laughs> yeah. I could say it because I grew up around them, and my my ex girlfriend's father used to smoke them, and they're dipped in wine. So his face was always purple because they dipped the cigars oh, in wine. Wow, wow. Crazy. And so they never looked. Italian. But where was he from? Was he from like Pittsburgh or something? I don't. I think he might have been from Pittsburgh. And I just saw a story. I saw something about him where they talked about bad, bad Leroy, Leroy Brown, Brown. And when they were talking about who that character was based off of. And it was based off some guy that he really knew who was in the army with him or something like that. Who was a bad motherfucker. <laughs> It's got to be a good biography. Of I s- there is a good biography. There's a behind the music about Jim Croce. And uh, Cheech Marin's in it a lot. I think I saw that. Yeah. I think I did see that. Do you know that years later, I did, I was playing drums for a movie. Uh, someone asked me to come play for the, it was the main title of the movie. It wasn't for the whole score. And I was playing drums. And the artist was Jim Croce's son. Wow. What's his Adam Croce? It was I can't remember his son's name. Mm. Very talented. And and he was about a year old when Jim died. Yeah. And or a year and a half. Something like that. He was just a toddler, that's for sure. Yeah. But there was some bad stuff going on with his mom and Jim at the time. They were divorcing or they had split or just in the middle of it. And you know, that stuff can get really hazy. And I went up to him and I said, you know, I gotta tell you something. I worked with your dad. And he looked at me and he went, oh, cool. He went on about his business. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I felt I bad for him because, I mean, he never really got to know his father. And I had the feeling, I'm sure it's changed now because we were, he was a kid. Years, yeah, the years have hopefully healed uh-huh. all the wounds. I, I would hope so. But as he was a kid, he probably didn't get a whole lot of tribute to his dad from his mom. Maybe Is not. That what you're saying? Maybe yeah. not. I I just got. I I could have been totally wrong. Sure. He maybe he was so nervous about the session. Right. It was a big date. It was a big movie, and it was it was a big part. He was singing, and I think he had written the song and okay. the whole thing. And a very talented kid too. Yeah. Well, I I remember there. Be, my folks lived in San Diego for a while in the '90s, and I remember there was a uh, restaurant downtown, the Gas Lamp, called Croce's. That was, I think, his might have been his wife. I had heard that it was his wife and his son. That, yeah, the, and that his son played there all the time. Oh, so yeah, yeah. Hopefully, maybe the. Uh, if I wonder there, if that's if there still was like a that. rift. Perhaps it has healed. Yeah, but that's the moment you think. I know your dad. I mean, you'd you'd want to collect that information. Yeah, absolutely. From somebody, you know, like, absolutely. Yeah, and then just stop and think for a minute. And here we are. You would think, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You would think. I, I mean, I really don't. Don't, I should be careful. It was my experience that day, and it kind of shook me. It made me feel bad for him, I just thought. But I I can't, I don't know. Maybe Jim Croce was an asshole. No, he was not. (laughs) I mean, maybe if you were married to him. Well, I get why you're, I get why you're being delicate about this, uh, about the story, because you're telling your side of the story. And who knows what he was going through that day or whatever. But if he happens to listen to this, there's a kindness about this story that I I think comes through. I just thought he would have been too young to have had a bad experience. Yeah. To remember a bad experience. I would have thought. Mm -hmm. So it had to have been ingrained somewhere else. And then I thought I wish someone had told him some good some of the good things about his dad. Because he was a great guy to hang around with. Wow. He was completely down to earth, and Maury was great. And those guys died. It was a drag. I mean, it was of course it was a drag, but I mean, it was really painful for us that were friends. Yeah. I mean, when I got the call from Tommy West, I remember Tommy saying he almost was matter of fact about it, and I thought I was just. I got off the phone. I said to Hugh and to Holly, his wife. I said, "You're not going to believe this, but Jim Croce just died in a plane crash." 
So aside so, from aside from being like a, like a reason you don't really like to fly as much, I mean, you're, I'm assuming you're pretty young at that time too, and that's a pretty formative time when you're just sort of becoming productive and you're getting used to what you're doing and you're figuring out like your purpose, and then you see somebody like that, like talented, cool, just disappear. Did that change? Did that change anything else in your in your life? Is like the way you approached your work or personal relationships? I don't think I was that smart. I think it was just well. Let, maybe maybe that's it's great that you weren't it, affected it, it, that way. It was. I remember that at that time I was just developing my my phobic flying thing. I mean, I fly yeah. now. I go back and forth to the East Coast. I'm in New York a lot, and I go to the Vineyard, and I go to Miami a lot, and and I do do some gigs now and again. But it was being on the road. When you're on the road. We were flying every day, sometimes five days a week we were in an airplane. Yeah. If you're flying five days a week, That's a lot. weird shit's going to happen. Mm-hmm. I mean, You're asking for it, it feels like. And I was starting to get nervous. I mean, I, when I didn't start out that way, and then I started to get nervous. And, I, and I, there was a f- series of things, and knock wood, everything's okay. But it was just that. I'm just one of those guys. You know, they say, uh, they say that creative people... Are, are often that way. Sensitive but there are many things. times I've been with bands where we're bouncing around like popcorn and they're reading. And I'm like, can you please be really fucking scared like I am so that I don't feel so incredibly alone? <laughs> I remember I remember I was I was doing a gig and, and I we're went back. We're flying through <laughs> the sky. Right I, re- now. I remember I went back. We were, I was on the road and I took. A, uh, we had a couple of days off, and so I we were going to be in Pittsburgh and went back to New York with Tony Levin. Tony was out with uh, Frampton, who was opening for us, and I went back with him. We went back because we were old friends, and he was going. I said, "I'll go." Yeah. And I'll come back. We'll come back together for the next gig, which is in Pittsburgh. So, Tony and I are on the flight. Just he and I. The rest of the band's already there. Tony and I are on the flight from New York to Pittsburgh, which is, what, an hour and a half? And it was snowing, and it was bumpy, and Tony's sitting next to me, and he's reading. And I'm petrified. I go, Tony, what are you doing? He went, oh, right. I'm supposed to be scared. Okay. <laughs> he, got he said, yeah, all right. I, I won't be so comfortable because I know you don't like flying. And he was happy that I was flying with him, so he's. We could have been upside down. He'd still be reading. Cool as a cucumber, that Tony Levin. There's a lot of guys, and he's a very, very creative guy. There's a lot of creative guys that went, that's not the reason. That's just because I'm phobic. Yeah. Wow. So uh, we're rounding third base here. We want to be respectful of your time. There's a couple things that I want to ask you. And now that you know what the Break It Down show is and and, uh, what we do here, one of our missions is just to capture these stories for posterity. Because we're going to put this up on the web, and then it's going to be there. And all uh-huh. these great stories from artists, musicians, writers, whoever along the way who have captured something important about, hopefully, things that aren't everywhere else. Who else should be on this show, Rick? Hmm. Steve Jordan. <laughs> I'd love to have Steve you Jordan. You know what? I always think about him because, because he does so many other things, people don't really really talk about him as a drummer as much anymore yeah. because he's producing, you know, he's playing with John Mayer, but he's producing John Mayer's records and keeping him on on a straight track. He's music directing at these big events. He's doing some musical direction thing, I think, in either in New York or here. Somebody was just telling me, oh, it was in Nashville, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Uh, Or or now. And, And so they don't, recognize or don't talk about what an amazing drummer he is. Yeah. This guy's an amazing, amazing drummer and he should talk about his, he should talk more. He should be more about known. About the craft. Yes. Cause, yeah, absolutely. Because he has so much to offer. The, and I've known him since he was 18. Like when he first came to New York, he's an 18 year old gunslinger. Gunslinger. Man. And he yeah. could play. Yeah. And um, if you want to check out I'm saying this for Mark and for our listeners. You want to hear some good Steve Jordan? There are a bunch of YouTube clips of Steve Jordan with John Mayer that are terrific. Uh, also, Briefcase Full of Blues, the Blues Brothers. He played right. A yeah. That what about the record. What about the expensive winos? Keith oh, Richards. Oh man, yeah. Which he co-produced and he he uh, played on. I mean, he played some great shit on that. He did Groove All Stars one or two years 
with us when we, I don't know if you were ever at that show. Did you come to the show? No. It was the Yamaha show that we did in, in Cerritos, and it was really good. Okay. I'll show you the, one of those posters over there is from it. But yeah, Groove All Stars. A bunch of, JR did it every year, ah. and we, we all did it. Mm-hmm. But guys like that, I mean, Andy Newmark would be great to talk. You could talk to him. Uh, My brother Jerry is always yeah, a great I'd interview. To talk to your brother Jerry. Um, do you do phoners? Do you sure, phoners? I could do a phoner. I mean, we I, the one I did with Jr. was a phoner. One of these days, I'll catch him when he's in town, and I'm and I'm here. But you know, you were asking me before we go. You were asking me what I was doing lately, and I and not as much writing lately as my brother Jerry talked me into doing this gig. Mm-hmm. I didn't really want to do it. He dragged me into it. Two drummers, me and him. Okay. This summer, every Wednesday, we played at a place called Lola's on Martha's Vineyard, and he put this band together he found the singer joanne cassidy who was just unbelievable and i'm there every year and i never heard of her and she killed me so we started at this club every wednesday night and the woman said yeah you guys could stay here could play here on wednesdays because nothing nothing goes on here it's like 30 people the first week we were there maybe 30 people were there and it's two drummers mm-hmm. and then Jerry took out a little ad in the paper. I did a little radio interview. In August, Uh (laughs) Uh can hardly get into the place. (laughs) And I went up to the girl working behind the bar, and I said, very last gig we did. It got out what the hell was going on Very last gig we did. I said, what's the best night? How much have you been working here? She goes, well, August is, we're here seven days a week. I said, what's your best night? Oh, Wednesday night, by far. Yeah. Because... The place went, the place just, it just, out we, of control. we just hit it, man. We really, way. and I have to say, I hated it at first, and then I got to where I really look forward to doing it. The band is amazing. Jerry and I playing together is just really, really good. Really enjoy it. I, that would be, every once in a while, you know, one year at the NAM show, I walked into the Days Inn right there next to the Anaheim Convention Center, and on the little bitty stage in the bar, at the Days Inn was Eddie Van Halen and Alan Holdsworth. Oh, my God. And I love these situations where it's a tiny little bar and you walk in and just a couple of titans. Do you know what the Na- NAMM bar. show is? No. It's, we're going to go in January. National it's, Association of Mus- M- Music uh, Merchants. Music Merchants. It's, it's at the Anaheim Convention Center. It's huge. Every so. manufacturer of musical instruments comes out and brings their stuff that they're going to They have do another one year. in Germany called Music Messa. I've played that one too, uh-huh. which is even more massive. Yeah. But this show, this last year, was it this last year or the year before? This last year, we go to the NAMM show. We went to have lunch at the Marriott across the street. We walk into the Marriott. Who walks by me? Walks up on stage. You know how that Marriott has that little stage and uh-huh. people, some guitar players? Stevie Wonder comes up. <laughs> Yeah, at the Marriott in, in a hotel bar. <laughs> he sings either Superstitious or one of that uh-huh. with the guy right. who was playing. And it was Whose gig the it was. best thing that I'd seen at yeah. the NAMM show. Oh, I love that. One song, and then he walked bar. off. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at lunch. That. At lunch. <laughs> lunch. The guy who managed the, the restaurant, we were standing there watching, and the guy who managed the restaurant, there were about four of us, right? It was John DeChristopher, me, and... Uh, it might have been his son and someone else. And Johnny, John the Christopher was the president of Zildjian Symbols uh-huh. for years. And so I've known him because of my endorsement with Zildjian. We've become very close friends. He has a place on the vineyard now with his wife, Kelly uh-huh. Firth, who's Vic Firth's daughter. Okay. And they have the, the Vic Firth sticks and all that. Thing. So we're, we're watching that. The manager comes by and says, you guys, the place was packed. He says, that was so amazing. I'm buying you lunch today. He wow. bought us lunch <laughs> because it was so incredible watching TV Wonder doing this thing. It was unbelievable. Well, the first time I met you, I didn't actually meet you. I was at the NAM show. I worked at Ken Osorio's Pro Drum Shop, and uh, I was there with uh, my boss, who was the partner in the store. His name was Jim Mazetta. And we were standing around the Yamaha. There was a Yamaha. It wasn't just the booth, but there was a stage. And I think Vinny, it was Vinny was playing. And I was standing next. To, I was actually standing next to you uh, and Armin Zildjian. Oh, really? And we were watching Vinny play, and I didn't have any idea I was standing next to you. And then when the whole thing was over, Jim, who was there, you know, there was a 
enough of a crowd there that he didn't get over to us. And then when we finally met up, he goes, did you meet? You were standing next to Rick Morata. Did you meet Rick Morata? And I was like, what? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Um, funny. Yeah. So, well, what I will ask you is uh, whoever you think would tell their story best in a forum like this where we just turn on the mics and go, all right, go with a couple of guys who get what we're getting. And, uh, mm. and, and don't, don't take your time. Uh, we, we got plenty of time. Well, have you talked to Vinny? No, I haven't talked to Vinny. Um, is it only drummers? No. Actually, the closest connection we've had to Vinny uh, before I'm sitting here with you is uh, we had a bass player on named Richard Ruse. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got a bass amp company now in uh, Simi Valley called uh, Trickfish. Uh, but he and Vinny were roommates in Boston. Oh, wow. So, you know, we'll, uh, we'll try and catch Vinny. We'll try, we're gonna try, I'm just going to try and catch everybody. Vinny's hard to, to nail down because he's so bloody busy, but... He'd, he'd probably be great. Keith Carlock would be someone great to talk to, too. Yeah. Because Keith's Keith's a great guy. I'll, I'll try to just do some thinking and figure out. Okay. Jerry, it would be easy. You could just call <laughs> That'd Jerry. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You could, if you can do a phoner or if you're going to be on the if you're going to be on the East Coast, I can hook that up. Or if he might be coming out here for the NAMM show. They're talking about trying to get us to do this Marauder Brothers gig somewhere at the NAMM show this year. I don't fun. know if we're going to be able to pull it off on short notice, but they're working on it actually right now. Okay. I like this NAM show thing. Yeah, we're going to go. We're going to go. Closing comments. I'm just going to say this, man. Hey, you've given the world so much great music. As a drummer, you've given me so much uh, inspiration. And, uh, you know, everybody says nice things about you all the time. And I'm glad that here we are in a face-to-face. -face, and I'm today was a, a terrific day for me. Great. I'm glad, so I'm glad that I could... Uh... I don't, I don't know that we had any really interesting stories, but I, if I can think of anything interesting, I'll, I'll send them to you. All right. We didn't even talk about Warren Zevon. Uh, all right. Well, then, uh, hey, Next let's, time. let's do it again. You, you can come do back? it again, sure. All right. Yeah. Sure. Rick Murata, everybody.